people didn't want to sell you drugs because you were too scary look like you were yeah too fucking yeah that's how i got the name nasty. booger from yeah. the revenge of the nerds in it but when you live and play the undercover role you're playing a bad guy you know especially when you're living it i mean i'd spend hours with days you know all i mean a year with it. and you know you kind of get that mentality like oh shit you know i gotta remember i'm the police here Look, man, I appreciate y'all being here today. Um, you know, look, I think we're we're out of time. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna try to you know you know pontificate on this, but we're at a uh, I, I think a incredibly complicated time right now for law enforcement in the, in this country, and it's a big reason why I think I set forward to to, to try to um, even do this. You know, after what happened with with George Floyd, and like the entire nation was sort of like focused on this. You know, I found myself. My cousin had just died from COVID. I was up in the you know, where in my home where I live, you know, in the country. And, you know, I saw all these people sort of marching in this movement against, you know, what those officers did that day. And, and, and you know, to be honest with you, you know, that like that really resonated with me. Like I thought like what that guy did was was really wrong. But then I put on the TV and I saw people, um, you know, throwing bottles at police officers and throwing things at police officers. And that like killed me because I know every single one of those people is a father, a husband, uh, a brother, uh, you know, a son, you know, a sister. And, uh, you know, I, I just felt that, you know, in that moment right there, you know, why can't I be both? Why can't I say what that guy was wrong, but also be extraordinarily pro-law enforcement, understand the necessity of police officer, understand the, the pressure that the police are under and uh, understand, you, you know, how unbelievably misguided it would be to let the actions of a few um, take down this institution that where I think people are taking, you know, perhaps the most uh, important walk by putting on a uniform every single day and going out and keeping us safe. Uh, I'll stop talking in a second, but I've been enormously blessed, I think, in, in, in my career for, for a whole host of reasons. I get, you know, I do what I love and I get paid for and all that bullshit. But, you know, the best thing, without a doubt, you know, about what I do is, is going into these different places, you know, meeting the folks that, um, you know, my character, meeting the folks that, that, that live in the world that these characters would, would, would play and getting to train with them, get to know them. And, and I've developed literally, you know, lifelong, life changing friends. And, um, you know, man, you and me, uh, I, I love you with every bit of my heart, man. You know, like we've known each other for fucking a decade now. And, um, you know, and you introduced me to Tony. I've, I wrote out with you. Everybody in your unit, you know, every all those guys, I just immediately had love for and had an immense amount of respect for. And then most recently, I got to work with uh, with, with with Dre, you know, in Baltimore, and um, you know, we we got to hit it really hard. You know, um, we got to get out on the streets in a in, in a really really major way in, in a big city that I think is also sort of at the forefront of, um, you know, uh, uh, a city really being taken over by by, by violence a city really suffering from the, the scourge of handcuffing your police department and not letting them police the way they want to police. And, um, you know, Dre and I have, have known each other now, you know, for a little, little less than a year, but it's, it's another one of those. We're going to be brothers and yeah, I love this man. We're going to be, you know, forever. So, you know, let's just start, you know, Carl, how, how long was your career in law enforcement? Uh, 32 years. And the majority of it was working narcotics. Just about the whole career was working undercover in narcotics. When I was when I met you, I was lieutenant over the unit ten years ago, and I'll never forget the first time I met you. I mean, I didn't have any clue who the hell you were, <laughs> you know, when I first met John. In fact, we were in the car riding, and we were going up through the hood and stuff like that. And I was showing you filming locations for Snitch, yeah. and uh, you and Rick, and. Uh, I met John. He was in the back seat, and I looked back. I said, "So, what do you do?" He goes, "I'm an actor, but you probably never seen any kind of shit." I've <laughs> like that. I was like, "Oh, okay." So, anyway, we just hit it off right after that, and mm -hmm. I actually introduced John to. Uh, you were wanting to know about playing drug dealers, and I introduced you to one of the old OG guys. You remember? Oh shit! You're that, <laughs> that, that's uh, that informant yes. at, at the fucking yes. uh, in the parking lot. In the parking lot at Walmart. Oh, shit, that's you right, man. That? Yeah, he was taking a piss when it's we in walked the, in. In the middle of the day, I was like, Walmart. "That ain't fucking." We're like, "We yeah. gotta go meet my impor informant." Yeah. You see, yeah. the guy pissing yeah. on that car. I said, over that's there? him right there. Yeah, and he, you were worried because he tell you, talk to me. I said, "Shh, you give him money, he'll tell you whatever the hell you want to know." That's and right, uh, yeah. oh yeah, yeah, that's the first time John and I, and that was it. We just hit it off since then. And, and and Tony, like, he's kind of a legend around these parts. Like, how, how would you describe him? 
Uh, I mean, he's he's a good. He, he was my supervisor in narcotics. Uh, he pretty much taught me everything that I knew that I know now. Uh, man, it just I don't know a lot of words can describe what you know, what he means to everybody. He introduced me and my wife. Yeah. Uh, you know, I don't even. I don't even got words I could describe, you know, the love that we have for him. So. And, and a lot of it also is just like beyond, I, I think like, like, like with Dre, like a lot of the folks that you introduced me to, I think there's something about like the plain clothes, kind of like aggressive tactic policing uh, in this country where it's units. And it seems to me that there's like an unbelievable amount of closeness that are, that that's kind of um, bred and fostered in those units. And that's because you guys, um, your job is just much more unsafe than, you, you and know, we're with each other more than yeah. we're with our own family so i mean 24 hours a day. yeah i mean yeah i mean i spent more time with him and, and the time that he was my supervisor than i did with five my own kids so you know then you're you're in life and death situation together and you know it just it makes you a lot closer so and i know with you in in, in baltimore with like the gun trace stuff and and the plain clothes you didn't really do undercover it's just plain clothes yeah i wanted to i wanted to do undercover but that's a completely different animal I never, I never did undercover. You see, work is. It's it doesn't next seem like level. there is much you see work in. in it's a little it? different in Baltimore, because um, it's so dangerous. You know, with the you see work, I don't know if you guys carried while you were. Oh shit! Yeah. Oh. Man. Did you carry? Like oh, yeah. while you? Oh, did yeah. these motherfuckers yeah. carry oh, when they see, take a crazy. piss? Like, yeah. I'm carrying there, right yeah. now. <laughs> I, I, I used to detectives don't carry. Oh what? Right, really? because. Oh my god. I mean, like the element, the. Uh, the criminals in Baltimore, they're so street smart. Like you read, there was an instance that, you know, there was, there was a gun and it was probably, it was used against, they were going to use it against the detective. So they figured it's better not to carry, oh, shit. No. but it's very, you know, they do a lot of smart things because like it's our, our hands are tied behind our back. So you have to like investigate, you know, a little bit different, yeah. you know, outside the box. Sure. 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 You know? And when we did our mid level, which was like our, Long term, anything that lasted, you know, months could last a year and a half. You know, that was we would investigate. We would know most of the time who we're buying dope from. You know, kind of like that. And you know, you're a little bit better prepared. Now, the most dangerous, I always tell everybody. And I was over street level, and that's what Tony was in too. And he worked mid level dope, and he's on long range of dope and stuff now. But the street level was always the most dangerous because. Number one, it's kind of like being a vacuum cleaner salesman that, you know, back in the day, you're going to go knock on a door that you have no clue and try and sell them something. We're going to go knock on a door. We're going to stop somebody on the street and try and buy dope from them. And, you know, you're going to get the reaction of it's going to be somebody that, you know, like, can I cuss? <laughs> oh, yeah, you can fucking <laughs> yeah. say oh, whatever okay. you want. Yeah. Okay. They're going to say, fuck you, motherfucker. I don't do dope, you know, or... You're going to rob your ass because, you know, oh, I don't know this white boy coming up in here, you know, and you're going to family give me, you know, and, and I got a, a you remember the guy that was in the prison, was in prison for bank robbery mm -hmm. and the funniest story in the world. Our, we were buying dope from this guy down in uh, close to Allendale area and our walkie talkie fell out on the ground mm -hmm. and he picks it up. And this guy's already showing us all the bullet holes. He's been in Angola for 30 years, showing all the stab wounds and uh, <laughs> It was a funny, I mean, I couldn't help but start laughing. And he goes, oh, oh, oh. I said, oh, shit, man, drop my radio. He goes, damn, that looks just like a police radio. He picks up, he said, man, that's heavy, just like a police radio. And uh, I was dying laughing. I'm like, no, no, we were construction. This is my boy. And the other guy in the car was, I said, that's my brother. By the end, I'm just dying. I'm, I'm laughing so hard. And he, he stole our money, of course, you know. But, I mean, that was just some of the, the funny shit. And that could have turned deadly right then because we had no idea. And that's the street-level dope. Like I said, shit, we've been robbed and shot, everything. But because you're just, you got to have just the biggest nuts in the world to pull up to somebody you don't know and approach them or get out and pull behind somewhere. They're going to direct you somewhere, you know. And we would do, what was the most, 30-something people a day we've done before on those? Yeah, I think, we've, I think we've had, yeah, 40, 50. Yeah, um, I mean, we were just insane how many people that would sell us dope, you know. And then, but I, I think that's the most dangerous because I have no idea who I'm buying from then. Yeah. I don't know if that guy just killed somebody. I don't know. You know, he wants my money. You know? it, it, what he's kind of describing, too, is like, so we're in street level, so it's short-term investigative mm -hmm. narcotic work. Yeah. So not only were we narcotics, but we kind of were the, the band-aid for the city. If there was a violent crimes in, you know, a certain neighborhood, they would send us there. Uh, sometimes in unmarked cars, trooping, jumping out, things like that. But we also did short-term UC work, and that's what he's saying is, we don't know who we're dealing with because right. it's not a long-term investigation. We're just 
we might see John walking down the street. We're just going to roll up. Hey, man, you know, you got some green or you got some, you know, whatever, and, and just go from there. Obviously, right. if John's not a dope dealer, he's not going to sell it to us yeah. if, you know, right. if he is, you know what I mean? He so might, you, you know. create a team, bro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, yeah, uh, exactly. you know, we don't do a whole lot of that anymore here. I, I mean, I've talked about with the guys in Baltimore a ton, but in your opinion, like, why do you think the sort of, you know, plain clothes aggressive unit or taking the fight to the criminal type uh, uh, policing? Why is that getting abolished well, in this country? I think the UC work now is mostly done, and like he's still doing it, is by informants, and it's a lot more safer, you know, for the law enforcement guys and stuff like that. When I first started in the game back in '84, I mean, you know you would go and just buy dope. I mean, a lot of times you didn't have some backup and stuff like that. We didn't, you know, you could wear a wire sometimes and technology sucks so bad. Yeah. I mean, you know, you may stick a freaking gigantic tape recorder in your pocket and nobody knows what's going on. And it's, you know, it's dangerous for the agent. But if you have an informant there, you know, that are embedded with them, you can buy dope and they'll prosecute off the informant stuff these days. But, but you I, were very much like on your own. I mean, I know you were kind of like with biker gangs for a long time. I mean, you were very much on your own sort of playing, playing parts, basically. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I was an actor, but, you know, I mean, I didn't get like bad reviews. I'd just get killed if I fucked up <laughs> real bad, you know. But to me, you know, I loved it. I used to do this thing all the time. And back, you know, nowadays you can't do it. The UC is not allowed to, unless it's an emergency, affect the arrest. Because, number one, they think he pulls out a gun, a badge. You're like, oh, this son of a bitch is jacking me, you know. So <clears throat> it's real dangerous. Back, back in the day, and I'd always say, man, I've been buying dope for somebody. And I'd say, man, I got some good news and bad news. And, you know, like, oh, shit, what's the good news? And I said, I got a job. And you're like, no shit. And I pull out my bag. He said, what's the bad news? You're under arrest, motherfucker. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was fight or flight. You yeah. know, and I loved it. I mean, that's what I was hoping. You know, that I moment that. right there. Oh, like my that, God, the I reaction that. to that, it's, it's going one way or the it's other. Going one right or the other. That, is, yeah. that is that's the best is. moment. Like, <laughs> that's when you feel time. like you're alive. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, yeah. This is what I'm here to do. <laughs> that, and, you know, so many of them. I had them before. Like, I pull a badge. You're like, man, that's cool. Where'd you get that thing at? No, no, you're under arrest, motherfucker. No, yeah. All right, man, I got to go. No, no, you don't understand. You're under arrest. And, you know, I mean, I have and all kinds of on. funny stuff. Yeah, it's like that's, that's what I wanted. I wanted that shit, you know. And I wanted to do it before the other guys came in because I wanted them to catch me in the middle of a brawl. You know, I mean, that was it. You know, that was the funnest thing in the world. And I had him before. I had a guy that used to buy a meth from, and he would give me a gun. He would say, now, look, the fucking, he looked just, I call him Charlie Manson. And I actually have a picture of him to show you. He looks just like Charles Manson. And he would give me a gun when he would go get my dope for me. He said, now, look, the fucking cops come to my house. You kill them. <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> I'm going to shoot him when he comes. So he'd always give me a pistol. And he always had another one here. And the day that I decided to bust him, I brought my partner in. And he hid in the bedroom. And I did the good news, bad news with him. you know. But he was nuts. And he just started laughing like crazy. And I'd put the, the gun that he gave me on the little coffee table and unloaded it. And so he looked at me, he looked at that gun. And I was like, fuck. Of course, he dove for the unloaded gun. So I didn't shoot him, but ended up whooping his ass pretty yeah, good. Yeah, yeah, but he yeah. didn't even think about the gun in his pants. You know? wow. He just saw that one right there. But he just laughed like crazy. But that's, I lived for that stuff, you know. And that's Tony Tay. We've worked undercover together many times. And, I mean, it's just a, it's a, it's an adrenaline rush. Yeah, and for me, I'm not a real speaker. I don't, I kind of don't like that interaction, but it kind of gets me out of that comfort zone doing it, you know, making me speak to people I don't know. So that in itself is kind of a little rush for me. And then, of course, learning from him, just rolling up and just, you know, just talking to people. I learned so much from from just that. You were old school. You were pounding the pavement. So, like, when this detective, Lieutenant, I'm sorry. Yeah. Lieutenant Detective, right? Uh, when he puts that case together, it's like, I did this, I saw that. Now with informants, you know, you're dealing with someone that the information does come in, but it's like you have to triple, quadruple, you know, you have to check that. Because if you write a warrant based off what the informant says and it's wrong, that's on the detective. See what I'm saying? So like, I like that version better, but like the powers to be don't like it because he's out there. I feel like the people that like him that did it should be allowed to do it. And like you, you know, like you're more so on the uh, surveillance, I would say, right? You, you use more, more like today's technology, right? And the informants. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. That's you what see what I'm saying? Like, it's a now. beautiful combination. They both work, but. And, and I was privileged to get a little bit with him. Which and now is amazing. I'm kind of, yeah, so I was able to get the UC work, do all that, learn from him, 
now we're kind of so in that makes you two headed monster. So so it's uh yeah right because you learn from yeah, old yeah, school oh, yeah, techniques yeah, yeah. and you're and you're learning you know, you're working oh, the yeah. way you're working. So like when he leaves, right? These these newer guys they don't, we don't get that. And that's what we're missing. I gotta say, I work in Baltimore, but being down here, this is wild. This is <laughs> so wild. But it's it's like it's cool, but like it's mm-hmm. different. It is different. I can imagine working these streets. Yeah, and you know, and I've of course met narcotic agents and and cops from all over the freaking world. You know, been to so many you know different uh got narcotic conferences and everything. You know, and we all every known to cover narcotics club I've been to, we all. No matter where they were from, we were brothers like that. I mean, you just knew, you know, especially back in the 80s and 90s and stuff. I mean, we all had that same, you know, UC mentality. And I've never met a freaking undercover agent that was worth the shit didn't have a gigantic ego. <laughs> and I, to every narc has an ego. I love my boy here. He's got an ego. I promise you. Does he have an ego? Oh, he's got it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. How many times he showed you his abs? Huh? Is that, oh, see, she knows. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. But I want to touch back on something, too. It's kind of bothering me. The whole carrying. I, I don't carry when I did undercover work. And I went to a school that, that kind of taught me the dangers, the pros and cons of it. And, and what I took away from it was, I mean, somebody's going to kill you, they're going to I mean, if you do undercover work and I hold a gun to your head, there's nothing you can do, right? And, and with us doing short-term stuff is we got some of the baddest dudes on the apartment that are, I mean, a block away, you know? I mean, so doing... Doing the short-term stuff, you got a you got a react team that's following you, going everywhere. I got the baddest dudes in the city that's going to be there if something happens. That's They're going to be the one that, that, that to handle it if you know. So so I never cared, and and I did initially when I first started doing it, but once I went to a school and just kind of I don't understand, Tony. So why, why? So you're saying because if you have the gun on you, I mean, it puts I, I just you felt, in more danger. Yeah, I felt like it would my confidence. I just felt because I was always just worried, man, can they see it? Can they see it? That if it that comes would tip at, you, you know, off that you'd yeah, be a and cop? then, you know, yeah, just, yeah, but obviously because I mean, I carry it in a holster, you know, dope fiends or dope dealers don't usually carry it in a holster. So, I mean, it's a lot of, you know, just, it was just self, I knew it was there. I was worried they knew it was there and I just feel like if I if I needed help, man, they're right there, and that's I mean that's how know. we do it up. We have and, a, and, and a, a but but you team. know, but it's really just kind of preference. Like I said, he would carry. I think uh, the other guy would carry a lot, and and now I carry where I go, you know, outside of that. But I just, uh, I just it's cool what you said that uh, you don't like having the gun because because of the confidence, right? So that it forces you to think your way out of this situation, which is again. One of the coolest things you can ever do, like to think on your feet, and it's like if I fuck up, I could die. So let me, yeah. and, you know, and I've done so much long term stuff. I mean, you know, cases I've worked eight and a half, you know, eighteen months, two years, and I mean, I've been felt up, you know. So I mean, and I've had them before, you know, like they, oh, you know, I had the girls, you know, that's what their job was to do, dealing with certain groups. They'd come hug on you. And they'd feel, and they'd like, oh, what's that? You know, I said, fuck, I ain't going there without that. And they'd pull their shit, neither do we. You know, I was like, at least I know their arm. You know, I always wanted, and I did a, like, a ton of stuff by myself. You know, I mean, that was my my high, that was my adrenaline rush. And my a lot of times back then, there was no backup. I mean, they couldn't hear you. You know, if you did have a wire on, it wasn't with the shit back then anyway. <laughs> you know, so... That to me, I always want to be able to have a gun because I've been in situations before. I mean, some crazy situations where you know I've had to rely on you know knowing that I had a gun and stuff like that. You know? And 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 uh, just to, and also just to go back on, uh, you you think that the reason why they're not putting undercovers out there in that way anymore is for officer safety? Uh, you know, it, it's a lot of guys I know that use and nothing but informants. We had uh, street, you know, he he was. He didn't. He was a, one of the best on narcotic agents, but he never were. He just didn't do undercover very well, and he used nothing but informants. But it was always safer because you know your informant's already there. He's already embedded in with that group. They know him. They've already bought selling dope to him. And usually an informant, you know, you got the mercenary was doing it for money. You got the guys that they catch, you know, and they're going to either, you know, you're going to work or go to jail. And like you know, I told you before, 99.9% of them are going to afraid of, fuck yeah, I'll work, you know. I don't want to spend a bunch of time in prison. So, you know, and then working off, the ones working off charges and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So it's a lot safer because they, they're already in there, you know. And I agree sometimes that, you know, certain in certain 
organizations are not going to let a new person in there. But I guess, I, you know, because I know, like, you know, the other thing that, you know, obviously spending this much time in Baltimore, especially with Baltimore police, you know, it's basically a northeastern city. So you got just liberal. It's just like a different kind of like political agenda. And I guess like being here, we're in Louisiana. You know, this is considered like deep south. Part of the reason, correct me if I'm wrong, but at least the way that I thought it is a lot of the reasons why the flex squad units got disbanded wasn't just because of like the corruption of Wayne and all that bullshit was because basically the the majority, it's the same thing that my my friends in LAPD tell me. Those groups have been disbanded, the jump out boys, the units like that, they've been disbanded because that's where the majority of the sort of complaints were kind of coming from. They, look, if police work's not pretty, it's that age old thing. If you're going to be engaging the most, you're going to have the most problems. That's why, you know, with that sort of agenda, we get rid of, we disband these units. But that's also a lot of folks feel like that's that leads to, you know, enormous spikes in, in, in violent crime. And I guess have you guys being you know, deep South red state. Have, have you guys felt that as well? Like a change in policing? He can, he's actually on, he can still. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's yeah. changing. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, it's, we're fortunate here where we are that we still have this, like the street level type team that, that, that we were on where they're out there, you know, gloves off and the, in the community, uh, you know, still stopping everybody and, 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 and reducing crime. Uh, you know, it's obvious if, 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 you know, we went to a time where, where they were not out there as much and crime kind of went up. And then you send them out there. And, and our street level isn't but about it's probably less than 10 people, including you probably have like two supervisors and probably six to eight people, depending on, on, on staffing. And what was it back in the day? It was, I think it was two, two super, no, yeah, two supervisors and about eight to 10. It, it was, yeah. and, and they've always kind of, attempted to keep that unit staff because it's a unit that like i said we're the band-aid for the city anytime there was an issue anywhere they send us whether it was to go stop car you know trooping traffic stop stuff like that or to go hey y'all go you know do some under short-term undercover work in these neighborhoods get search warrant but because it, it shows i mean we could show up to a neighborhood i'll give this an example in the neighborhood here they were having burglaries a uh, ton of burglaries and man they couldn't stop them they sent one unit in there and <clears throat> try to help reduce it it kept going, so they sent us in there. We had 40 arrests uh, by just trooping. Was trooping just doing traffic stops, uh, Terry stops, stuff like that. And uh, we did 40 arrests in a four-day work w- work period in a neighborhood that they had already sent some other units in that they were having issues with burglary. We shut down that neighborhood. Can you I mean, walk me through that? Like, wh- why does that reduce the burglary? Our street-level cars are blue cars. Uh, people know what they are. They know that we're we're going to get out. We're going to talk to you. If you're walking down the street, if we got any reason to talk to you, we're going to. And, and they know that. So they're not going to be outside doing anything. I mean, they don't take long. We can be in a neighborhood for five minutes, make a first traffic stop, and they'll be like, hey, we already know y'all are here. We're, you know, it's already been a mass text out. So just our presence alone would, would, would shut down neighborhoods. Yeah. And uh, and just because of the history of, of, of street level, uh, just, uh, you know, they call them the jump out boys here and, and – just the history from the '90s all the way up, you know. I, I definitely want to talk about training because I know you guys, tra- you know, the way you've dealt with training and, and how important training is, and with everything, with your your, your hands, your weapons, like everything. It's fucking, you know, you know. I, that, that's like my, if I if I want one thing to change, you, you know, as far as me not being at all an expert, but for my platform, it's like training, fucking training, training. But um, I guess my question is, um, if you're going into a situation in any situation with another group of people and violence goes down, you're either the kind of person who's going to like help or you're the kind of person who's going to split. And I know that that just exists with me. And, and, and I'm just wondering if you guys can sort of talk about that a little bit, like what your, what your take is on that. I actually had a lot more in common sometimes with the informants and the bad guys that I arrested, you know, than I did with normal people. Cause I would be out to dinner, my phone ring, you know, it'd be an informant talking about selling dope and I'd be in there talking how much they want for that bird and this, you know, and people are looking at me, you know, and like, who is this piece of shit, you know, here looking, but I related to them, you know, I could relate to the people we arrested, you know, because we lived in that, you know, you, you're out on the street, like he said, all we're with each other and we're out on the street all the time. You kind of get to know those people and that's the kind of, kind of life you seem like you're living, especially when you're working undercover because you start, the lines start kind of blur right in there, you know, mm-hmm. because, I mean, I have had to pull myself out before because I'm like, man, I'm getting to be liking these people, 
a lot more than I like some of the other people I know. And I'm getting to have a lot of in, in common with these. I mean, people. that's how you kind of had your nickname, right? Yeah. Like people didn't want to sell you drugs because you were too scary. Look, like you were yeah, too fucking yeah. That's how I got the name nasty. Booger from yeah. the Revenge of the Nerds, the nastiest yeah. looking guy on the show, you yeah. know. And I was working for the DEA at the time and went to buy some dope. And these people were like, "No, nah, man, we're scared. We're, our dope isn't good. We're, you're going to come back and kill us in the middle of the night, so we're not selling <laughs> you." And I was like, "Wait a minute, I'm too nasty to buy your dope." And uh, I mean, they just left me. They told me they're going to call the cops on me if I didn't leave their house. And I was just sitting there with like the crickets chirping. I was like, holy. And I met the guys that, that I was working for at the time. You know, they're all clean cut guys. And, they, you know, like, man, you may need to clean up. You know, I was like, shit, it's time to take a bath or something, you know. But I do. I, I related to those kind of people. You know, that was kind of my life was with those. And I did see a lot of parallels in between their lives and my life. You know, except I was a good guy and they were a bad guy. And you had to kind of remember that all the time. You know, but when you live and play the undercover role, you're playing a bad guy. Mm-hmm. You know, especially when you're living it. I mean, I'd spend hours with them, days, you know, all, I mean, a year with them. And, you know, you kind of get that mentality like, oh, shit, you know, I got to remember I'm the police here. Have you ever been in situations with folks where you, you, you've seen guys on your unit where you felt that they weren't willing to kind of, they weren't willing to kind of jump into the fight? Or have you, have you ever seen it? Or, or, or do they just not make it on that unit? I, or vice versa, yeah. you see guys who take it too far? A little well, Narcai, he can tell you too. We've had many people try out and come. And if they're if they're not cut out for it, they're not going to freaking make it. You know, we've had cops scared freaking to death. I remember one guy that uh, he came to narcotics, and uh, he was with another agent. So we're going to go buy some dope, and he pulled up to a street corner, and he wouldn't roll his window down. He goes, "You got to roll your window down." <laughs> he goes, "Nope." He goes, "You got to roll down your window." That sounds like half the writers. Yeah. Oh my god. Yeah. That was, <laughs> that was funny. He goes, "Like roll your window down." Nope. He goes, "Well." We can't buy dope, man. Mm-mm. And he'd like trying to roll the guy's window down, you know. I mean, it was freaking hilarious, you know. And it, he was gone. You know, so, like, and, and so, like that. I mean, you, you know, you ain't gonna cut it. You know. And what? And what about the opposite? You seen folks who've been too heavy handed at times, or folks that you've had to pull back. You know, the only people that were heavy handed were the force on force. You know, I mean, we're not. I'm not out here. If I'm gonna fight somebody like him, I'm gonna fight somebody like him. You know, I'm not gonna be just wrestling around. You know, when it comes to he starts throwing punches. Well, I'm going to start throwing punches. You know, I'm going to escalate as much as I can to be able to get there because I'm fighting for my life out there, you know, until somebody, my guys get there. But, I mean, you know, we were always taking care of business back in the day. But now did we like, you know, I mean, some crazy incidents where we beat the crap out of somebody for no reason, no. You know, and the supervisor, you know, couldn't allow that, you know, anyway. Because especially in the days of, you know, freaking cell phone technology, everything a cop did. Everything they do is on camera. You know, I mean, everything's on video. So, I mean, you don't want to, I don't want this guy because he pisses me off to cost me my life, my livelihood. So, you know, and if any of my guys would ever do that, say, okay, hey, that's enough. You know, he's. Yeah, man, uh, yeah a lot of times, like if we see somebody we think, you know, that's went a little overboard, you just step in, hey, man, I got it, I got it. You know, you just kind of, you know, step in and, and let them know, hey, I got it. Because sometimes, I mean, if, if they do, they don't do it on purpose, they're just in condition black. And, and and it doesn't happen often, but when it does, you just you just kind of step in. Hey, I got him. I got him. You know, and you let them know. Hey, I, I got it now, and, and you can kind of walk off and and let me let me deal with. It. As far as when they're being heavy handed, but as a new officer, I was taught failure to disengage is 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 ninety nine percent of your complaints. So meaning, if I put my hands on you, once it's over with, I'm explaining to you why I did it. Hey. Yep. You know, hey, you know, you did this, I did this, you did, you know, and a lot of, most times they're like, all right, man, I understand. Like, you know, understand. as long as you, you explain what you did, I mean, I've never had anybody have an issue with it. Like, oh, I get it. You know, I get it. Appreciate you explaining it to me. So failure to disengage is, you know, talking to people is real important. Yeah, so, it is. Uh, you don't you get, know. you don't get complaints that way. Yeah. yeah I mean, Cause they understand. It, yeah. It, and, it, it's, it's yeah, yeah. Like I said, most times they know they did wrong, but if you explain to them why you did it or, or, or you know, hey, well, you did this, I thought you were doing, you know, I, I thought you were going for a gun, so you know I threw you on the ground. You know they're, they're, they understand. They're like, yeah. oh, I get it. Like, what's going on right now, man? Like, what's going on with all the violence and the shooting, and 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 what is from your point of view? Man, just my point of view is, and really just everything going on in the world as far as the pandemic, uh, low you know low unemployment, uh, just all of that to me is just a breeding grounds for crime. Uh, you know, just that alone is a breeding grounds for crime. Uh, you know, crime's going up in every large city in America right now. I mean, I know Shreveport's not a large city on the national side, but it's the third largest here in, in Louisiana. Uh, we're at, we're two away from from our, our record murder. I think uh, we're tied. What is it? We're tied. We're tied. Uh, Eighty-seven. Eighty-seven. And we yeah, only have about right a 
I think we're around 200,000 people. 87 so, homicides. 80, 87 mm-hmm. homicides. And that's not shit. I mean, they're shooting every day. So, <laughs> yeah, so I tell people, shootings. like, yeah, so we we've, we've, were at probably f- between 400 and 500 shootings in Shreveport. Now, that's shooting where somebody was hit with a bullet. Uh, it's, it's about the number we're at. So that's not, you know, we have a phenomenal hospital here. And they and we got a phenomenal fire department here. I mean, and they do wonders when people get there. So we're thankful for them. But uh, it's uh, I mean, four hundred shootings, five hundred shootings. That's, that's a lot. Yeah, I was talking to you know Rich Wilson, mm-hmm. you know, and he told me that eighty percent of the people he knows have been shot. Yeah, yeah. Oh man, yeah. And you know, it's always the wildest thing. A cop can get shot with a twenty-two caliber pistol. But a guy on the street can get shot nine times, you know, with a forty-five, and he's not going to die. It's mentality. My, my wife's bro- mentality. one of my wife's brothers. Uh, so my wife, she's from Cedar Grove, just a neighbor, a low-income black neighborhood, and, and, and it's where she's born and raised. So she's got three brothers that are uh, known gang members. One of them's been shot in the head and, and in the uh, artery. He's still alive, thank God. But I mean, you know, it's. Uh, do you get along with those guys? Do I do. I mean, I, I, really, I mean, they really they just chose different, yeah. different. And, and I, I'm a believer that police and, and some criminals are kind of we're kind of walking the same line. I mean, we're not much different other than, you know, we're not committing the crimes. But uh, yeah, but, it's just a decision. Decision. yeah but we get we get along good. I mean, they they love decision. me. I love them. Now you know they know I don't condone their lifestyle, and we we keep you know, we we keep. But I mean, there can be a real mutual respect there, right? No, there is. There I mean, is what's there. something you? I mean, besides obviously your brother-in-laws, but like, what's something you've seen from from, from a guy on the other side? What's something that you've seen that you deeply respected? Like as as far as have you seen anything from the quote unquote criminal element in this city where you say, you know, that's a stand. You, you know, I respect what that guy just did. Uh. Oh, that's kind of a hard question. Uh, is it, I mean, maybe, maybe there's, maybe, maybe the answer is you haven't seen it. Yeah, you know I mean, I mean? yeah, I mean, you know, you, a lot of the, the, a lot of the gang members have loyalty to each other. I mean, that's obviously something you can yeah. kind of stand behind. But I mean, do you feel like that loyalty is much different than the loyalty that y'all have to each other? I think it's all the same. Uh, you know, they, they got a brotherhood and, and they're going to stand with it. So, you know, you can respect that. I mean, whether I agree with it or not, you know, you can respect that, that, that they're loyal. Well, I can tell you, like, when I got ready to retire, I had people, informants. I had crying. I mean, I had them coming to me and saying, man, I cannot believe you're going to leave. You know, what am I going to do? I'm like, well, shit, you better stay out of trouble is all I can tell you. And I would run into people that I've arrested. I mean, I can't go anywhere without I've run into my I've arrested, you know. And always, all the time, people will come up to me and say, you remember me? And I'm like, that's somebody I arrested, you know. And I've had them so many times come up and shake your hand and say, man, you saved my life. You know, I mean, that's happened so many times. And people, you know, if you treat people decent, you know, they're going to respect you. If you don't make it personal, I'm not going to make it personal. It's just a business to me. You know, I'll arrest you. You go to jail, shit, you know, that happened. You know, don't make it personal. You make it personal, then that's something different. But, I, you know, I would talk to people all the time I've arrested. You know, it doesn't bother me a bit. I, You couldn't go anywhere in this town without running into somebody. Yeah. I still do all the time. Man, and that and treating people with respect, because any of us can be on the other end. Of any, you know, there's points in our life that something's occurred that's happened that's steered us in the direction we are. So, you know. Yeah, I mean, they, they definitely have their coat on. But, you know, like I said all the time, I mean, the majority of the ones I've arrested, they won't mind telling on each other. You know, like we talked about before, you know, the snitches, you know, get stitches and all. That was the first guy that's going to rat on somebody, you know, because, you know, I mean, really, I mean, how many times would they come informants would wear those yeah, shirts? Yeah. And I'm like, holy shit, really? You're yes. going to bring this here and you're one of my great informants, you know? If you were looking at going to prison for the rest of my life, fuck yeah, Tony did it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right now. I saw him do it. Yeah, it's I'm like, not going it's like you said, like the loudest, like, like you know if you let's say we do a search warrant there's five dudes in that room the one that's the loudest you know is probably the one that's gonna when you get him privately he's gonna tell you everything you know he's gonna be the least loyal out of the group you know and the guys that just sitting there just not saying anything and they're probably not gonna say anything it, i mean there's self-preservation no matter what you know everybody's gonna preserve you know them set their family and stuff like that and you know they're looking at going to prison 20 years and they're like oh shit no you know this guy's out there bad he's got me selling dope for him yeah i'll tell you all about him you know and we've had informants that everybody knew they were informants and people would still you know do dope and stuff with him it was the craziest thing we had one that comes to mind i stopped him we were doing the trooping thing and i stopped him he passed by me up uh, on a certain area of town and he had his like music going crazy you know and 
you know, I mean, you could smell the weed coming out of his car, and I pulled him over, you know, and I said, man, you know, my, in our blue cars. I said, what the hell are you doing? And I said, you ain't got no dope in there. Oh, yeah, man, I got a bunch of crack in there. He goes, but, you know, I got a, I said, I what? I was, you remember that? And I was like, are you out of your freaking, so I called his handler, the guy that handled, I said, you need to come over and get this idiot, you know, because, you know, he's going to go to jail. And, uh, of course, all he ended up doing was having to work off those charges in. But everybody knew, and he told me, he said, I got dope, man, I can't roll around up here without no fucking dope in the car. <laughs> and I was like, are you insane? You're telling me, you, I, and he's yeah, it's right there. You see it, Townley? And I was like, <laughs> Like, I understand how in certain situations, if you talk about Wayne Jenkins, you talk about, like, super-duper crooked-ass, like, corrupt cops, which there, there's bad apples in every fucking, you know, that that blue line can kind of be toxic and bad. But fuck, man, like, if you don't want people out there, like, running into that place, you, you, you know, to, like, keep us safe, like, what are you talking about? Like, if you can't understand that that's, like, heroicism, I just think it's it's so important that people, like, know that. You know, I, I think people people need to know that, that, that you know, guys are laying it down on the line for each other every day in, 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 this, in this country. And also need to know that, you know, look, there is, there is, like, real fucking evil out there. I mean, Bam Bam saying, man, it's like, we need police. I mean, that's a guy who's spent the majority of his life, you know, most of his life in Supermax, you know what I mean? Like, people have really forgotten, like, what we really do. Like, our military goes somewhere, and they know their enemy. See what I'm saying? Like, gangs, their loyalty, or they go and take a bullet for themselves, but it's only in that world. Like, we will take a bullet and save everyone, including ourselves. Like, I don't care that you're a gang member, but like, if you're shot, I'm here to help you. Like, there's a little kid, I'm here to help you. The whole spectrum of, 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 of humanity. Plus, we take care of ourselves. And the reason why we're so close is because we know, yes, I helped that gang member that got shot the other day, but if I'm shot, will he help me? It's a 50-50 chance. And, and, but on that, I've had people where, and I give this story to people is, when I was on patrol, we got in a foot chase with the guy through some alleys, through a fence. Uh, I mean, he finally just gave up because he realized that he wasn't going to outrun me. And I mean, it was a long pursuit. He just laid down. And I just went up my handcuffed and walked him back. And he just kept saying, man, you didn't beat me up. Why didn't you? He was so baffled that I didn't beat him up. And I'm like, man, you gave up. You know what I mean? And I've seen that guy on a handful of other times because I worked that neighborhood. I mean, he always dabbed me up. I mean, he respected me just because I didn't, you know, I didn't beat him up. But it... it, it goes back that that you know yeah that's class act. yeah i mean it, it's you know and and, and they know that they yeah know yeah that, and, and they also know well, y'all are working i mean you're working together you know it's like you're almost like it's yeah, like yeah. you're working together i've had it's bad guys same. defuse the situation yeah you know, oh, you're surrounded with 20 30 people they're like you know you'll have a guy no no y'all y'all what the hell you know man i know town y'all back up yeah, yeah. imagine just job. told me a story the other day when he was in a fight with someone and his gun popped out and a guy who like ran that block went and stood over the gun and just like waited for him to do he's like nobody's touching this gun. i was in the middle of a fight and my my magazine ejected and like people were coming up to me like oh here's your magazine <laughs> well i'm arrested yeah what do you feel like how do you guys feel about kind of guns in general in this country i remember the first night i think we went on, not the first ride along we went on, but we, I think it was the second ride along we went on when we were here. I mean, it was a long ass time ago, but I remember there was like two guys that were like obviously gang members and like you guys pulled them over and you said they were gang members and they like, and, I, and maybe it's my own, I'm fucked up and I've been hitting the head a long time and smoked a ton of weed and all that shit. But like you guys got those guys out of the car and both of them like had guns right there and you guys gave them their guns back. And, and like that to me, like from a guy who like grew up in DC, I like, could and you said to me i remember you're like yeah they'll probably it's hard giving that guy that gun back because like that guy will probably shoot at a cop sure. and like i like that baffled the fuck out of me man so can you guys just explain to me like what the laws are and how you feel about them in the state of louisiana uh your car is an extension of your home so you can have a weapon concealed in your car here all day long and everybody we know carries a gun i mean it's just we're a gun carrying so state crazy. and you know i we always assume that they're packing. I mean, you always do. And if you, as long as you do that, then you're never really taking off, you know, balance or anything like that. But everybody carries a gun here. And I'm a big Second Amendment guy. You know, like I said, you've been to my house. Shit, I've given you guns. You know, I mean, you know, I said, here, you better carry this. My yeah, anytime, wife has going a gun in her purse that. right now. I yep. guarantee it. You know, yep. she does. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, it, until they... Nobody has guns, and I think that everybody should be have the opportunity to carry a gun. Yeah, and I'm just like I said, I'm a big gun guy. I love them. You know, it's a hobby with me. You know, I collect them. I mean, 
I got World War II weapons, you know, I got all kinds of guns and stuff like that. And, uh, but I always assumed the bad guy was on, no matter what. As long as you did that, you were fine. But as long as they're not a convicted felon and they're not carrying illegally concealed, they get the gun back. Can you explain that, illegally concealed? Yeah, I mean, if, in state of Louisiana, you can have a concealed carry permit. And we have actually parish ones that you can go, as long as you're not a convicted felon or you're not convicted of domestic violence, then you can get an, a, 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 a concealed carry permit to carry a weapon concealed on your so that, so, the, so those two guys in that car, they didn't have concealed carry permits. But I, and during the car? You it doesn't matter. That, no, it doesn't matter. That's an extension of your home. You can have that gun anywhere hidden in your Look, car or whatever in the state of Louisiana. So it's pretty easy to get guns here. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, as long as you're not convicted. Yeah, felon, I mean, as long as you're not convicted felon, as long as you don't have domestic, as long as you don't have any type of mental... Uh, like you've never been in a, in a mental hospital and like that, you know, if you have it in your car, you can have it anywhere. But as soon as you step out of your car, you, you can't have it. Now, you can carry it on your hip as long as it, yeah. as, as long as yeah. you can see it. Yeah. Uh, you can, you know, throw a shot. Well, on part of that gun your... is can, you can see, like, we have open carry lock. Yeah. Right. So so if you so if it's open, you don't need any permit. You don't need like, any anybody room. in the city can roll around oh, with the gun as long as everybody can see it. it. Yeah. yeah. And what's the, what's the rationality behind that? Well, we've always been uh, – Sportsman's paradise. We've always been a southern state that have always carried with. No, but what's the rationality to being able to see it? Like, why why do you need a permit to conceal it, and and you don't need a permit to to? That's all. It's always been the the state of Louisiana law. Uh, concealed to be a concealed carry permit holder. It's kind of like it's almost a privilege to be able to carry that gun without anybody knowing that you have that gun. Now I see people that open carry, and for me personally, that's. I, I don't think you should open carry. As long as you can get a concealed carry permit, you should, if you're going to carry, carry it concealed because the first guy that you go into a bank to rob place, he's going after that guy with a gun. And that guy probably does not have the training that we did to be able to, you know, to be able to keep, to do weapon retention. We were trained so much in the academy and, and we went through all, we did it all the time, especially at SRT training, SWAT training stuff, you know, for conce you know, to be able to retain that weapon and to fight somebody for that, you know, that gun. But you got, I mean, you guys have law, I mean, you guys have dealt with all, you know, multiple officers that have been shot out here. Gun violence is like, kind of like skyrocketing. I mean, if you, if, are you guys happy with the gun laws down here? I mean, I know not for yourself. I, I know for yourself, but I mean, like, do you, would you, if you could change them, would you? Or and what would how would you? I don't think you could change them without saying, okay, you know, well, he can't have a gun because I don't like his tattoos. You know, as long as you're not convicted felon, you know, and I have no problem anybody and, being able to protect themselves. And, and honestly, violence. most most people who commit crimes with with guns didn't obtain them no, legally anyway. Violence. I mean, my biggest yeah. issue with a gun owner is you need to have proper you should have proper training. You should go seek it. It's not mandatory, but you should go seek it, and then proper storage. And yeah. The issue is, yeah. the issue is, yeah. people just leave guns in their car, leave the car unlocked, and people steal them, and then that's how these these gangbangers get it. But so, 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 so that's that's the that, to me that's the biggest issue is, is just. But just playing devil's advocate on that, Tony, like, isn't it just that like if guns are this readily available and it's so it's so easy to get them, that just makes more guns and more, more available for the criminal element to get them. And not and again, I'm not made. I totally hear you. Like, if there was a world in which nobody had them, that would be cool you know yeah. like whatever but like now everybody has them so you better believe i'm gonna have one so and and I, I get that and i understand it i guess i guess what i'm saying is like they're gonna they're gonna get a weapon somehow they're gonna have guns. yeah i mean they're, yeah, gonna, they're, gonna, oh, they're, yeah. they're gonna get yeah. guns somehow i'd rather good citizen have the gun also yeah. yeah uh we had a place called sport south which is out south of town that uh it's a big uh gun they get guns from all over the kid we had a whole pallet stolen one time of handguns stolen and I remember for years we were still finding those guns on the street, you know. But and also, to, I think like he said about it's, I think it's a necessary evil, you know, to have. A, and I carry a gun not just for protection of me, my my family, but I, you walk into a situation and there's somebody that's got a bad guy's got a gun on somebody, you know. I can take care of that situation, you know. I can save somebody's life by doing. it. My biggest issue is people just need to do proper storage. Right. They they leave guns in their cars and, and that's a big you know, thing. That really yeah. pisses me off. Yeah, too. and it's and like, they leave you know, cars unlocked. And, and that's yeah, how that's crazy. how a lot of times that's a lot of times how yeah. they they obtain these illegal yeah. guns is just because they they we break have in door their cars. checkers. Bur they just walk through neighborhoods 
in the middle of the night and they'll have a car usually driving down the street or parking one side and there'll be two guys and they get out and they walk through neighborhoods and they check the doors you'd be and surprised I mean, you'd be surprised oh, if people leave their, i mean you can probably go into an apartment complex for instance and i bet you you probably find 20 unlocked car doors just on any given night that's wow so does the guns have to be in plain sight or do they have to be concealed no, in the state, car? No, in no. the car. At your your house in state of Louisiana, your car is an extension of your home. You can have that thing hidden in the glove compartment. But 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 can it be in plain sight also? Oh yes, yeah. It can. yeah. It can so be it doesn't matter. There. No, it doesn't so matter crazy. in state of Louisiana. And you, so is, the, is the first thing you guys ask on the car stop is do you have a gun in here? Oh yeah. I mean that's you know, always, you know. You got any weapons or anything? You got any bazookas, you got any hand grenades inside the car? And most time, yeah, I have a gun. Yeah, okay, man, where's it at? I'm gonna clear. We're going. We'll check, clear the gun. Make sure it's not stolen. Make sure you're not convicted felon. I'm gonna put your gun. You know, I'm gonna set it in the trunk right now. You drive down the block. You can get your gun out, load it. You know, or yeah, I remember that's what it. you said. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. You know, don't get, don't pull over and get it right now. You know, you wait. You know, just so they can't readily get it and just decide to, to you know, to open up. Real quick, I just want to just go back to that training thing. Um, and, and just like the amount of, I mean, you, you, you were telling me the other day about how, you know, you guys used to go into houses and stuff like that. And once you cleared the house and they were out, you would go actually then train and practice in that house. Yeah. yeah. We would utilize anything for a training situation if we could, like we do search warrants and stuff, we get the situation cleared out. I mean, we would go, okay, let's do a run back through, you know, especially if there was something that, you know, kind of, we hesitate. There was a weird situation in the house that was a a fatal funnel we went in that, you know, we hadn't seen before, a, a layout of a house, and we would use that as a training opportunity. Okay, you know, get the bad guys out, we go. Especially if you have a new guy. You have a new guy, you can walk him through the house of, of why you did what, you know, uh, for, like, SRT-related stuff most of the time. Well, now they have stuff where you can, you know, they have breaching doors and stuff like that, but for the longest, it was just on-the-job training, breaching, yeah. talking about, you know, with the ramp, stuff like that, so a lot of times you can kind of go back through and, and, and kind of get a little bit of on job training that way with them. So. And you guys on your own in your unit, we're just kind of constantly training. I mean, there's yeah. martial arts, there's weapons, you, you yeah. know, I mean, we've been talking all this about guns, but like how important would you say the, the physical hand to hand uh, stuff? Who, who was it that I was training with in your garage? Oh, Steven Joe. Man. That guy. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That Steven Joe. Humbled he my can ass. Kid. Oh Holy yeah. Shit. I may have 14 guns. He's got about 23 on that him. And he's shorter and then he had me do the knife fight and stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yes. He was like, literally, he was like, yeah. no, then you just do that. I'm like, well, now my wrist is broke. And he was like, do it again. I was like, now my other wrist yeah. is broke. I'm like, God yeah. damn, dude. Oh yeah. And he I'm trains a fucking all actor, bro. He goes, <laughs> he'll train, he'll go, he goes down in Latin American play. He's trained. Crazy. He is. He is insane. Was everyone on the unit unit trained uh, with, 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 with uh, physical hand to hand combat? Oh yeah. Well, I mean, we, knife train we had everything knife defense we had i mean every kind of training and we took opportunities all the time like even if we had a slow time we were working i'd let them go to the range you know whatever you know the the more you train the more prof and it's it's all it's, i teach guitar like i was telling you for the guitar for vet saying and teaching guitar is no different than teaching firearm training it's all muscle memory it's my opinion that the ones that can handle themselves are the ones that can go look people in the eye, be cool in the situation. Would you say that's right? Yeah, I, I, I definitely gives you confidence. And then there's another thing we call we always call verbal judo, that you know you should be able to, you can talk yourself you know into situations. You can talk yourself out of situations. And we all know cops that as soon as they arrived on the scene, it was just something about them. You know, I can be talking to a guy. We're sitting there talking. He's calm. This other guy pulls up. I mean, that guy goes completely off on him. I mean, you know. You motherfucker. Because he could not defeat. He would just incite it more. Just presence. That's, you've seen the same shit in Baltimore. There's so many similarities. Yeah. 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 Some, some people just don't know how to treat people. And yeah. it shows. Yeah. But, I mean, but, but, but being able to treat people well also comes with having a sense of confidence on yourself, yeah. right? Sure. Like, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, yeah. yeah. If, you're, if you're confident in yourself, yeah, you don't have to go be the loudest one in the room because mm -hmm. you – you speak for yourself by just the way you carry yourself. So, yeah, and I think that's accurate. And being trained up, that builds confidence in yours. And people Definitely. can tell confidence. They can tell. They, if, they, they yeah, know. they would know. You pull up on the scene, they would know the shaky guy that's not real, you know, he doesn't. He's not the guy that goes to the range on his own. He's not the guy that works out. He's not that, that guy. And they could tell that. And, you know, they could take advantage of the weakness and stuff. People, especially guys that are on the street, they can read. Us, they know. How do you describe kind of the bottoms and, and and those guys and the bottom boys and some of these 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 folks that you know obviously you, you know this this story and that community that came into my life because of the story you told me you know and we've been kind of doing this together for a long time and in that process I've gotten to know these guys and gotten close with some of them and um, 
Who are those guys to you? You know, it was a job. It was a job. But, you know, and I told you a story about my mom that happened, and we never found out who was involved in that. I know it was, you know, it was part of that investigation that I did. And that's the first time that it's, you know, I've had people jump on me, stuff like that. You know, hell, I've had more money out on my head. I was like, commit suicide. I can make more money killing myself than, you know. You know, you had people always wanted you dead and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, that was the thing that got me was, you know, what happened to my mom. She was beat up over that situation during that. And we never found out who did it. You know, never found out who called it, who ordered it, if it was somebody. And I'm sure it was a, a youngster maybe involved in it because that's the ones that – that's the most dangerous that you ever see. The guys, the young ones that are trying to make a name for themselves. Same thing in the motorcycle community, you know, the ones that are the prospects and stuff like that. They were just a job to me. You know, it was an assignment and I liked it because we made a difference, you know, for the people that lived there. They were pretty much the people that were down there were held captive, you know, by the the situation they were involved in. And once we cleaned, I mean, it, you drive through there now, it's not near the same. I mean, they, it's totally different down there. You know, I mean, the crime, that was, police cars wouldn't go down there unless there were several together because of all the, you know, the violence and stuff like that. And, and, and just as specifically, like, those guys, like, you have, I mean, you haven't seen Goat, you haven't seen Alfred Brown and not the, since you arrested No, him, not right? those. You know, you know, some of the ones that went, I think it was 48 arrested and the uh, 12, 11 went federal and they got the big, a lot of them got the big time. Now, the other ones, yeah, I'd seen them all. You know, and so, like, for those guys, years. like, I guess it's, like, Goat, you know, Big Don, Bam Bam, like those guys. Like, who who are those guys? Like, back then, who were they? Sure. Oh, they were the OGs. Those were the guys that ran, the, you know, the original gang members. They ran the, that whole area. Everybody knew them. Everybody knew who they were. And that's why we knew that once we got, took the big guys off, that that whole area would crumble down there, and it did. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like I said, it was an assignment to me. You know, just like any, as long as they don't take it personal, I don't take it personal. Mm-hmm. That was a big deal, yeah. So I mean, I was I was born in '86, so all that was I was, I mean, way before me. But yeah, it, it had Damn a big. You're young, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm right? Trying to do the math, I'm like, fuck. Uh-huh. Man, I graduated. And I started in '84. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Damn. The, uh, <laughs> the uh, but yeah, it had a big impact on the community of Shreveport because that was, you know, from my understanding, it was a large gang that were terrorizing, you know, the the city and. Uh, and, and crime's been down since then, and now we're kind of now we're starting to see that again. Did you hear anything about those names specifically? Like, do you oh yeah, know yeah, who yeah, those they're, guys yeah, are? they're yeah, I mean, they're legends. Everybody knows who they. Are. Mainly just the story of the bottoms in, in general. Like police cars wouldn't go down there; they flip police police cars over. Uh, yeah. They wouldn't go down there by themselves. They would wait, for, you know, get you know a large number before they'd go down there, and sometimes not even respond to things. So you, you know, Sebastian Richardson, he's out now. You know, like oh, I mean, they're they're pretty much all out now. Yeah. You know, and 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 it seems like the main focus of what these guys want to do now is, you know, look, Goat's lost two of his daughters to, to gun violence since he's been out, you know, um, you, you know, the Wilsons, Reginald Wilson, and Richard Wilson, their son's kind of, you know, they, they're, they're extraordinarily worried about him, you know, like quick, you know, he's, he his son, you know, he's, he, he's, he's in for murder right now. You know I mean? They just see this kind of like eating up their own kids. And I think whether it's, I'm not going to try to, Psych- psychologize you know why they the, you know why they feel this way but I, it seems to me that what's first and foremost in all their mind is trying to make a difference now and trying to say that you know since they've been through what they've been through that they could do you do you think that they can be helpful yeah i mean yeah i think i think they can uh you just you know the, the new generation of, of of gang members or just new generation in general is just different from what it was that's like what they then. said and, and and you know what, what makes them different tony they don't really live by a code. That's then exactly they had a code. I mean, so just an example, like if let's say me and you are rival gang members and I see you, I'm going to shoot at you on sight. You know, whether your wife's with you, your family's with you, doesn't matter. And whoever's in the way is going to get shot. Well, when they would live, I'm not saying when they would live by code, that well, they would they would get you and not, you know, not anybody else. And, and, and me and Carl might be in a gang today and then we might, you know, be beefing or arguing and then he might come join your gang. So they switch. They, I mean, you really talk to people with who's who. But I mean, there are there are some larger gangs that have been uh, that are well known here now in Shreveport that are that are really taken over. Like, would you ever feel like would you be willing to? And I'm I'm not asking. I'm like like just philosophically, would you be willing to like work with those guys to try to make it? Oh yeah, hundred percent. I think sign up as a police officer. You're trying to make a difference in your community. It's not just by arresting people, but talking to people. Yeah, hundred percent. It's funny that you say that because I'm actually kind of going through that with you know I told you my wife's brothers, but. 
uh, we recently had a nephew uh, that was that was murdered in a gang oriented deal this year, but his brother's kind of going that same little that same road. So we're trying to kind of mentor him, and there's only so much I can do because I'm you know I mean he's he don't want to hear that from me, and uh, but so it's kind of going through that same little deal. It's trying to you know he, he's young, he's not even 18 yet. His brother died. At, it wasn't on his 18th birthday, but he had just turned 18, and uh, and then it, he's like 16. So he's on that same road, you know, just trying to. But they're different, you know. When 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 we work together, like you know, uh, a big influential gang like that teams up with police. Like when Peanut King and I walk through the streets, and they may not know me, but now they're like, oh, okay, it makes my job easier. It makes. Do you, do you guys agree? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And it's like yeah. Yeah. we're down because it's like. We get one common cause, peace. Well, yeah. Well, well then it. you'd be surprised how, many, how much you have in common with people. And I, I use my wife. I'm from the country. She's from Cedar Grove. I mean, we lived. To, if I told you our, our two lives, you'd be like, they would never meet. I'm white. She's black. She's from Cedar Grove. I'm from the country. Everything about us is different. But we have so much in common. I think everybody has so much in common that, that if they can sit down and talk. Like part of the problems with some of the protests and stuff is... Everybody wants the same thing, honestly. Everybody wants the same thing. Most people who watch some of the stuff that's been going on, most of your good police didn't agree with it. You know, but at, but most of the time we don't we can't have an opinion. I can't get on Facebook and, and, and say what I want to say. I can't because on either side, you know what I mean? I can't defend them, which I wouldn't defend most of them, but I also can't go in and, and, and say certain things because there's obviously policies and procedures we got to follow. But then that we all want the same thing, and, and if – if we could all get in the same room and talk, I think yeah. people would realize of how much we do have in common. That's awesome, man. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think that that's the whole kind of idea of, of you know what I'm what I'm trying to do now. And 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 a big thing, I'll be honest with you, man. Like a, a big reason why, also, I mean, besides sort of like what I was saying before, why I want to do this podcast and shit. But you know, man, I've been coming down here ten years. Oh yeah. I almost feel like I got divorced parents, you know what I mean? Because I want to see him. I want to see Goat, you know what I'm saying? And it's like, and I know that and I'm like, looking, I'm like, both of y'all would fucking like each other, you know what I mean? And it's like, the one thing I just do know is that we all just want our kids to be safe. We all just want the world to be, we want some peace of mind out here and, 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 and enjoy ourselves. Man, it's just like I said earlier, it's really just, I mean, we all could have been on the other side. Yeah, I was raised by my grandmother. My mom worked all the time. My dad left before I was born. I grew up in Queensboro, which is, you know, I mean, that's a hell of a neighborhood, you know. And, I mean, if I hadn't changed certain things, I would probably be on the other side. Because I remember calling, going to juvenile court, you know, for being in trouble. And I had my buddy's older sister come in and pretend like she was my mom. Because I didn't want anybody to know, you know, come for the judge, you know. She came in like she was my mom, you know. And, uh, yeah, yeah, he won't do that again. I was like, appreciate you coming for me. I didn't want anybody to know I was here, you know. And, and I had an uncle that was in law enforcement. He was an undercover guy. And uh, I always loved adrenaline, but I didn't want to go to jail after I'd been juvenile a few times, you know. And I'm like, you know what? I said, shit, I think I'm going to become an undercover cop because, shit, I can live both worlds that way and have all the excitement, you know. So That's exactly what I used to tell myself. Mm -hmm. I was like, yeah. I don't want to be inside. I want to go outside. I want to mm -hmm. drive. Mm -hmm. I want to talk to people. Yep. I want to, do, yeah. That's I became a cop like a drive awesome. fast and I get tickets. There you go. That was always. <laughs> there you go. Hey, uh, fuck, man. I I I, I really appreciate y'all's time and and uh, I'm I'm a better man for having you in my life, man. So, thank you, thank you, Drake. Peace and love. Thank you. Yeah, love you, man. Fuck yeah, appreciate love you, back, you. Man. Yeah, right on. Thank you, guys. Thanks for being here, everybody. I really appreciate it. If you dug what you saw and you want to hear more, subscribe, like, do all that stuff. Uh, it'd mean a lot to us. I hope you dig these episodes as much as we dig doing them. You guys take care of yourself.